Welcome to our overview of prokaryotes, a brief look at different types of bacteria and archaea and their major characteristics. Now we're only going to cover a little bit of chapter 22 in this course. In the next course in the major series, you guys will dive much more deeply into chapter 22. So our examination of prokaryotes, our bacteria and archaea, are really part of the field of microbiology since we can't see these organisms with a naked eye. Leeuwenhoek is credited with making the first microscopes, and they look like this. You can see a tiny little lens over here. You would put your specimen at the tip of the needle here, and I see a few knobs that would work similarly to the knobs we have on our own microscopes that move the slide around over the stage. So he was a Klossman and also a lens maker, and it was said that he would make a bunch of different microscopes and each microscope would be set with a specific specimen. And he was a really curious guy. He examined water, anything that he could get his hands on, feces, pond water, human samples. He saw little things like this in his microscopes and he used to call them animacules or beasties. It wasn't really till towards the end of the 19th century that people started calling these um, microorganisms or microbes. Looking at prokaryotes, these are the oldest type of cells, much older than eukaryotes. They're much more simple in terms of their structure than eukaryotic cells, and they're much more abundant. Even on our own bodies, our human bodies, even though we're eukaryotes, there are many more bacteria and probably archaea on our surface and inside our bodies then we have actual human eukaryotic cells. So we can see here that they were found even over a billion years before eukaryotes came about. And even though we know about many of them, there are so many more that we do not know about it and we have not described them at all. Of the ones that we do know about, not very many are known to cause disease, although we tend to focus on these because these cause problems in our daily lives. And for the prokaryotes, there are two domains. We have bacteria and we have archaea. For archaea, these tend to be extremophiles. They tend to live in extreme environments, either extreme temperatures, uh, very salty environments, and we'll look at some examples in the next few slides. To give you an example of an extreme environment, we have this hot spring found in Yellowstone National Park. The temperature of this hot spring can go up, go up to about 159, 160 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that is about 70-ish degrees Celsius. And just compare that to our body temperatures. Our body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. So this is very hot. And even at this temperature, certain prokaryotes, these uh, archaea, can still survive. And in fact, they prefer these hot environments. Here's another example of an extreme environment. The Dead Sea is also very salty. It's hypersaline. If you've ever gone to the regular beach and accidentally tasted the ocean water, the sea water, the Dead Sea is 10 times more salty. But these salt tolerant prokaryotes, uh, these archaea, live and thrive in this water. So we call these halophiles. These are salt, halo refers to the salt, Files is like philic, that means loving. So these salt loving prokaryotes thrive in this environment. So a quick look at what are the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Some of this we examined in an earlier chapter, but as a refresher, we can look at the differences here. Unicellularity, so prokaryotes are always single celled, whereas eukaryotes can be single celled or multicellular. For prokaryotes, we'll see that many of them, because they're single-celled, do come together and form associations and biofilms, where they come together, attract more cells to the region, and secrete a sticky layer that protects them and allows them to stay together and even attract even more bacteria or other prokaryotes to the area. These prokaryotes are much smaller than eukaryotes, usually 10 or more times smaller and most of them are less than one millimeter in diameter, which is why we cannot see most of them with the naked eye. 
in our classroom, we'll usually use the scale of or the units of micrometers to measure the size of prokaryotes. Remember, these do not have a nucleus. There's no membrane around their DNA. Instead, the region where we find their DNA, we call that region the nucleoid. There's no nucleus, we have a nucleoid. Their chromosome is a single circular double-stranded molecule of DNA. And they often have additional DNA, and we call this extra chromosomal DNA. It's outside of the main chromosome here. And these are often in the form of plasmids, smaller circular forms of DNA. So if I had a bacterial cell, for example, here, let's pretend that's my bacterial cell. It usually has its main chromosome, a larger DNA molecule, this one. And then it might have a plasmid DNA molecule. And that would be that small one over here. For prokaryotes, they do not go through mitosis like eukaryotes do, and we'll see that later on. Most of them divide by binary fission, where they take a copy, they make a copy of their DNA, I should say, and then they, the cell gets bigger and they split into two cells that are identical. But they can also go through exchanges of genetic material, and we'll look at that shortly. This slide is a continuation of the previous slide, looking at more characteristics of prokaryotes and how they differ from eukaryotes. This is a pretty cool uh, trait that prokaryotes can go through, horizontal gene transfer. What does that mean? So in contrast to eukaryotes, many eukaryotes can go through sexual reproduction, such as humans, where sperm and egg come together and produce offspring that are genetically different from the parents. Bacteria and archaea cannot do that, right? They go, they divide through binary fission to create identical cells. So how does genetic diversity increase in prokaryotes? One way is through this horizontal gene transfer. And this is called horizontal because it, these cells are exchanging genes with members of the same generation. If we could do this in humans, it would be like me walking around, seeing someone with maybe green eyes. I have brown eyes and I, maybe I see someone with green eyes and I'm like, oh man, I wish I had your green eyes. And somehow I could take some of their DNA put it into my own cells and change my eye color from brown to green. That would be kind of like what I'm trying to describe for horizontal gene transfer. Cells from the same generation transferring DNA with one another. It's not a form of reproduction. So we'll see this in a little bit. Looking at internal or compartmentalization, excuse me. Remember prokaryotes do not have membrane bound organelles. So they don't have things like mitochondria, chloroplasts, but they do have ribosomes since ribosomes are not membrane bound necessarily because they can have, we can have free ribosomes. There's no internal compartmentalization. And again, those ribosomes are different from eukaryotic ribosomes. They're smaller and made of different um, proteins. Some prokaryotes have flagella. They are very simple in structure, more simple than eukaryotic flagella and made of different proteins as well. Finally, prokaryotes, many have a cell wall. If they do have a cell wall, then their cell wall is made of peptidoglycan. So I should say most of these have cell walls. Very few do not have cell walls. Bacteria, their cell walls are made of peptidoglycan. For archaea, they have cell walls as well, but they're not made of peptidoglycan, and that's one major way to differentiate the two, to differentiate bacteria and archaea. We've seen a picture like this before. If I'm looking at a prokaryotic cell, we see a nucleoid region where the chromosome is found. I see some free-floating ribosomes. Remember, their job is to make proteins. I always have to have cell membranes in my cells. For prokaryotes, they usually also have, or almost always have, a cell wall right outside of their cell membrane. Some prokaryotes, but not all, might have a capsule, a sticky layer on the outermost layer of the cell. Also, some prokaryotes might have pili, singular pilus. So plural is pili. And that is used for attachment and also for that horizontal gene transfer I mentioned earlier. 
And again, some prokaryotes have flagella or a singular flagellum. For bacteria, most bacteria come in one of three basic shapes. The first one shown on the left, these are cocci. Singular would be coccus. These are spherical cells. The middle one, we can see these are rod-shaped cells. They look like hot dogs. Bacilli is plural. Bacillus would be singular, one of them. And then on the far right, we have spirilla, which is plural, or spirillum, singular. Oops, spirillum. Sorry, that looks messy. Spirillum, and you can see these are spiral-shaped, but sometimes they simply look wavy. When we have any kind of living organism, we always want to classify them based on their structure and their major characteristics, and sometimes their metabolic characteristics, what kind of nutrients they can use, what kind of uh, chemical byproducts they can produce. So based on these characteristics, whether they're physical, like shape, or biochemical, like nutrient use, we have created many different types of prokaryotic groupings, classifying these microbes into different groups. And in microbiology, we have these Berge manuals, Berge's manuals, I should say. One is known as the systematic manual. The other one is de determinative. And these are very useful if you're trying to find out uh, the specific characteristics of a bacterium. We also know that there are many more bacteria that exist that we've never been able to culture or grow in the laboratory environment. And the only reason we really know they exist is because we have been able to sequence their DNA from the environment and we know they're out there and we know where they belong in terms of classification, but we're not able to grow them in the lab environment because of the factors that they need in order to grow properly. For bacteria, one of the most important methods to classify or group bacteria is into these two groups, whether the bacteria are gram-positive or if they're gram-negative. The difference between these two, gram-positive and gram-negative, is the thickness of their cell wall layer, that peptidoglycan layer. In gram-positive bacteria, their cell wall their peptidoglycan layer is very thick. So I can see the peptidoglycan layer is this dark red layer here. It's much thicker here. In gram-negative bacteria, the cell wall, that peptidoglycan layer, is very thin. I can see that red layer is much thinner in the bottom cells. And again, even though it's known as gram-positive and gram-negative, this difference, it has nothing to do with charge. So we're looking at thickness of the cell wall. Positive means thick, gram-negative is a thin wall. And this is important when we're looking at disease-causing bacteria. A lot of the times, if someone, for example, has a skin infection, and we want to know, we want to narrow down the types of bacteria that could be causing that infection, we can quickly do something called a gram stain and see if these bacteria are gram-positive or if they're gram-negative and whether they belong on the skin normally or not. So looking at the cell wall, the cell wall is important to bacterial cells and to prokaryotes in general because it helps maintain the shape of the cell. And remember those three basic shapes, the sphere, the rod, and the spiral-shaped bacteria, the shape is due to the cell wall. It also allows the cell to resist or withstand hypotonic environments. And we're going to learn more about this um, in the next set of lectures where when a cell is placed in, for example, pure water with no ions or other solutes, water will tend to rush into the cell, which can cause the cell to burst. But with cells that have cell walls, they can withstand this water entry a little bit more than cells that do not have cell walls. Archaea have similar molecules in their cell wall, except it's not peptidoglycan. It's another protein sugar complex that makes up their cell walls. Looking at gram-positive and gram-negative cells, we can tell which class, which group a bacterium belongs to, if it's gram-positive or gram-negative, by performing something we're going to be doing together in lab 
called the gram stain. Because gram-positive bacteria have a thicker peptidoglycan wall, they're going to be staining a purple color after this procedure. Whereas gram-negative bacteria, because they have a thinner wall and less peptidoglycan, they're going to stain pink at the end of the gram stain. And I'll show you why in a bit. There are four steps to a gram stain procedure. And the first step is not really part of the gram stain, but it's something that you have to do in the lab environment anytime you want to stain bacterial cells or some other kind of cell. This is called fixing the cell. So if I had a slide, a microscope slide in the lab room, and I wanted to stain my cells, I would take the cells and smear it over my glass slide, let it dry, and then heat fix it. And heat fixing means you pass it over a bun burner, Bunsen burner and attach the cells to the slide. So here what I see is the procedure in the left column, gram positive cells, remember that thick wall, and then gram negative cells in the rightmost column. These are the thin wall, thin, thick here. So here are the four steps of the gram stain. Step one is I'm going to use a stain called crystal violet. Crystal violet is a positively charged stain and it looks this violet purple color. And I'm going to apply it to my bacterial cells, both my gram positive and my gram negative cells. And in both, it'll stain the cells purple. So I see purple here and purple here. And this represents that thick peptidoglycan layer this one over here represents that thin peptidoglycan layer, and there's an outer membrane as well for these cells. The next step is something called iodine, which is sometimes called a mordant. A mordant. Iodine binds to the crystal violet, producing very large crystals that trap the crystal violet in the cells. So these remain purple, and the same thing happens here. These are still also purple. The third step is alcohol, and we often call this a decolorizer, decolorizer. So alcohol is usually pretty hazardous to cell walls, and it breaks down the cell wall. But for gram-positive cells that have a really thick cell wall, nothing really happens. This cell wall stays intact, the cells retain their purple color from that crystal violet and iodine complex. Whereas in gram-negative cells, they had a really thin wall. So that alcohol will easily break the cell wall and the crystal violet iodine leaked out of the cell. So during this uh, alcohol step, these cells are now clear, clear cells, whereas these cells are still purple. And our final step is a counter stain with a stain called safranin. This is also a positively charged stain, which binds to our cells really well, and it looks reddish pink. But imagine you're coloring and you have purple pen and pinkish red pen. The purple masks the pink color, so all you really see is still purple. Whereas on the right, the safranin will bind to the cells, but because the cells were clear in the previous step, you will be able to see that reddish pink color. So at the end of the gram stain, these four st steps, gram positive cells are purple, gram negative cells are pinkish red. And this is another look at the same thing. In this case, I have a gram positive bacterium in that column, gram negative. I'm attaching the cells to the slide in my first step, the fixation. I have my crystal violet where both cells are violet colored. Iodine traps the crystal violet in the cells. Alcohol does not break down that thick peptidoglycan wall in gram-positive cells, but here's the peptidoglycan here in the gram-negative cells. The alcohol easily breaks this layer out, so the crystal violet washes away and the cells are now clear. And then finally, my safranin is this pinkish red stain that does stain both cells, but on the left, the purple is darker, so it masks the pink color. On the right, for my gram-negative cells, the cells were previously clear, so I can easily see the pinkish red color. That takes us to the end of part one. In the second video for chapter 22, we'll look at a few additional structures on prokaryotic cells, 
how they exchange genes with one another, and a brief look at how they impact our lives.